Chapter 15, The Man Who Couldn't Sit Down. They pitched camp and they broke camp. Day after day, they followed running water. They washed out prospects, scraped from behind rocks and boulders in the stream bed. Spangles had a way of trapping themselves out of the current. When they found bits of color, they dug in. At times, Praiseworthy spent the entire day with his boots apart, swinging the pick in great arcs. Where the prospects looked good, they labored to follow the specks of gold to their source, which either disappeared or ended at someone's claim. Where the fleas were bad at night, they stuck a little candle in the floor of a tent, and in the morning, Jack would count the visitors to see whose gold pan had trapped the most. He kept track. I'm ahead by 82 dead varmints, he announced at the end of their first week of prospecting. And I've got the live varmint bites to prove it, praiseworthy answered, scratching his back. The days were long and hot. Yellow poppies had burst open in the hillsides like scatterings of fool's gold. Sometimes Jack would catch praiseworthy gazing out over some distant view as if it didn't matter if they ever got back to Boston. Smell that air, partner, Praiseworthy would say, as if mountain air had just been discovered. Pay dirt eluded them, but the next bend in the river might make their, make their fortune. They met other prospectors every day, and at times they seemed to be more pack mules and burrows in the hills than jackrabbits. After supper one night, Praiseworthy and Jack sat around their coffee fire, and a miner came along on muleback. Have a cup, said Praiseworthy, smoking one of the light, long nine cigars he had taken a fancy to. Can't stop, said the miner, as if he had a mouthful of gravel. A bandana was tied around his face, and one cheek, one cheek was swelled out. Got a powerful toothache. Much obliged, anyhow. Where are you healing? Over to Shirt Tail Camp. Where are you heading? Over to Shirt Tail Camp. I hear they got a tooth extractor up there. Jack picked up his ears, pricked up his ears, praiseworthy lowered his eyebrows. Would his name be Higgins? Dr. Higgins, that's him. The miner gave his mule a small kick with his heels and was gone. Jack shook his head. I hope I don't get a toothache. No, sir. The imposter, praiseworthy snapped. So that's where he ran off to. Cut eye Higgins, dentist of shirt tail camp. No doubt he extracts teeth and gold pouches at the same time. The days passed in sweat and hard labor. The two partners kept on the move, looking for a claim to stake. They passed from raven to raven. The findings were slim. Still, praiseworthy sang as he swung the pick and Jack whistled a great deal. They got used to the sight of Digger Indians. The woman in bright calico dresses would come to the edge of the stream no to pan in tightly woven flat baskets. The gold fever had passed no one by. Oh, it ain't gold fever, fever the diggers has got, a prospector told them. The yellow stuff don't mean a thing for them, to them. It's calico fever them ladies has got. And the men, they got they got serap fever and red sash fever. That's what they trade their dust for, poor devils. They do like to dress up, don't they? Like a bunch of youngins. Stubb caused them no trouble as long as they treated him with the respect Do a mule. Slowly, Praiseworthy and Jack added dust to their gold pouches, but they were as far as ever from striking it rich. Here and there could be seen mounds of dirt and coyote holes where other miners had tried their luck. They passed through abandoned camps where Chinese had moved in to sift through the diggings left behind by others. And they always seemed to be finding color that had escaped the pans and long toms and rockers that had come before them. Jack had seen rockers made out of anything from provision boxes to hollowed out logs. When finished, they had the look of cradles. You shovel dirt into a hopper at the top added water and rocked the spangles through to riffles in the bottom. Men could be found on almost every claim rocking the cradle like grizzled nursemaids. Jack was fond of carrying the squirrel gun. They had been shooting what small game they could, especially after their bacon gave out. One afternoon, late in July, after they had made camp, it seemed to Jack that he could he couldn't face another plate of beans. He picked up the squirrel gun. I'm going to hunt us a jackrabbit for dinner, he declared. I can't imagine anything that would taste better, said Praiseworthy, chewing on a piece of oat straw. I'll be back.
I'll expect you. Jack wandered off with the gun in the crook of his arm. He could feel new muscles along his shoulders and his legs had spring to them. If Aunt Arabella and his sisters could see him now, he thought, they'd faint away one, two, three. He stopped to take aim at a mountain cat he imagined crouched on the limb of a tree. Bam! He'd skin it and make himself a hat. The sun was setting and the sky turned red. He raised a pair of gray doves, but he didn't have the heart to shoot them. They flew off, making a sound as if their wings squeaked. High in the trees, Carpentaros were hammering away with their beaks. Not woodpeckers, he imagined himself explaining to Constance and Sarah. We call them Carpenteros in the diggings. Praiseworthy took advantage of Jack's absence to try little shadow boxing. He turned the pages of the book over his mind. Elbows in, left tap, faint, duck, sir, duck. Now the right, put your shoulders to it, sir. The sky began to darken and Jack was unable to flush a rabbit. Instead, a he flushed a grizzly bear. He, the great furry beast came crashing out of the shadows. He stopped Seeing Jack for the first time, Jack stood instantly petrified. He felt as if his boots were suddenly nailed to the ground. Twenty yards away stood a grizzly, and all he had was a squirrel gun. The animal rose on its hind, le hind legs and showed his teeth in a warning snarl. Jack tried to remember the things Mountain Jim had once told him about trapping grizzlies, but he didn't have a trap. He just had the squirrel gun, and the brute would brush off squirrel shot like so many flies. The grizzly opened his mouth wider, dropping some half-chewed acorns and roared. I'm done for, Jack thought, done for. He got his feet to move. He began to back up. Light was fading quickly. The grizzly dropped to all fours and came rolling forward. And then he stopped, for Jack had suddenly disappeared from the face of the earth. He had fallen down a coyote hole, squirrel gun and all. The bear went up on his hind legs again and peered everywhere. He snarled. He roared. Jack waited 20 feet down, afraid the grizzly would fall in on him. Then the sound of the Carpentaros brought buying acorns caught the beast's attention. He went crashing away to climb to go climb a tree. Jack was scraped and bruised, but had broken no bones. It was only after he tried to climb out of the hole that he realized he might be late for supper. He couldn't get out. The sheer earthen walls gave away at every hand and foothold. Once he got himself halfway to top, only to tumble to the bottom with a small avalanche of loose dirt, he began to call out, even though camp was too far away for praiseworthy to hear him. He shot it anyway and waited and shouted again. Finally, he took aim at the dusky sky and fired. The explosion boomed like a cannon and earth rained in on him. When the dust cleared, a face appeared overhead. Help, sir, Jack said. What are you doing down there? Trying to get out, sir. I heard you calling. You almost shot my hat off. Sorry, sir. I'll throw you a rope. After a moment, the rope tumbled in on Jack. He took a grip, firm grip, hung onto the squirrel gun, and the stranger pulled him out. Jack planted his feet on solid ground and heaved a sigh of relief. He was dirt from head to toe. I'm obliged, sir, he, he smiled. Why, you're just a lad, the man said, coiling the rope and hanging it on the saddle of his horse. And then Jack took a look at the stranger. He was a big man with worn boots and a white coat, a white linen coat. Could I Higgins coat? Jack backed away, almost stepping into the coyote hole again. What's the matter, boy? You look like you've seen old Scratch himself. Jack's heart was pounding. I know who you are. You're a road agent. Now that's a fact, the man laughed. But I've retired from the road agent profession. That's a fact, too. The boy was all shot, hung, or lost their ears. I got away with a load of buckshot in the seat of my pants. Why, I ain't been able to sit down in a month. Me and my horse, we both walk and hunt grizzlies. I'm reformed, that's a fact. You ain't seen a big fella around here, have you? I've been on his tracks for two days. Jack got a grip on himself, but he kept his distance. I'll bet you're still out hunting for Dr. Buckby's mine. Mine? What mine is that, boy? Jack blinked. Didn't he know? Hadn't he ripped open the lining of Cut-Eye Higgins' coat? 
Jack found himself leveling the squirrel gun. You pointing that thing at me? The reformed road agent laughed. Yes, sir. Now there's no way to treat your benefactor, is that? You stole that coat you're wearing, didn't you? I reckon I did. Belong to a friend of yours? Why, it gives me a bad conscience to wear this coat. Although I was awful fond of it, I'd appreciate it if you'd give it back. Always too tight on me anyway. He peeled off the linen coat and threw it toward Jack. Jack let it lie on the ground, even though he could hardly wait to get his hands on it. The mat must still be sewn up in the lining. The man took the halter of his horse. Now, if you'll just let me walk away without shooting, he smiled, I'll be obliged. Sure you ain't seen a big grizzly around? With the price they're paying for bear steaks, he's almost worth his weight in gold. He just left, said Jack. Then I'll be going. The ex-highwayman started away and then turned with a final laugh. Boy, the next time you point that squirrel gun at a bad hombre like me, you really ought to trouble yourself to reload it first. Good luck, boy. Jack's face reddened under the layers of dust. He watched the man disappear through the trees. He was sorry he hadn't seen more, been more polite to his benefactor. Thank you, sir, he called. Praiseworthy was just getting up to look for his partner when Jack burst into camp. Look what I've got. Praiseworthy peered at the white bundle Jack had made of the coat. If that's a rabbit, I'll eat beans. It's Cut Eye Higgins' coat. Jack quickly told of meeting up with the grizzly, falling into a coyote hole and being pulled out by the reformed road agent. Just as quickly, Praiseworthy unclasped his knife and ripped open the lining. They laid open every inch of the coat. They examined and re-examined it, and Jack's excitement died away. There was no map. There had never been a map sewn in the lining of the coat. The scoundrel deceived us, Praiseworthy muttered. He never lost the map to those highwaymen. It has no doubt taken him to Shirttail Camp, and he may not have located the mine even yet. Otherwise, he wouldn't bother to pull teeth. Put some beans on to fry, partner Jack. First thing in the morning, we'll start for Shirktail Camp.